O360 enables companies to understand the millions of conversations happening online every day, turning customer voice into brand advantage. All right, let's get started. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ian Beecraft. I'm the VP of Digital Strategy here at Epsilon. I'm going to be your host this afternoon on our talk about using artificial intelligence to conquest new markets, specifically for eSports e case study, but there will be some other interesting surprises as we go along as well. Uh, my guests today are Tom Edwards and John Dubois, which I'm hoping we'll get on the screen shortly, and they can introduce themselves um, on the other end of Skype. We're doing a bit of a remote uh, cast today. I'm here in Chicago while John and Tom are uh, broadcasting from Dallas, Texas. So in a moment, they'll be joining me, and I'll have them introduce themselves, and we'll get started on how to use AI to conquest new markets. Hello, this is John Dubois, CEO of Oculus 360, and I'm excited to be here today to talk about the role of AI in interpreting unstructured data uh, so that we can use it for brand and retail advantage. And I'm Tom Edwards. I'm the Chief Digital Officer of the Agency Business here at Epsilon. Uh, John's been a great strategic partner with us over the past 24 months, and part of our role is taking both structured and unstructured data and trying to drive insight that drives business strategies. So we're looking forward to unbundling it all for you today. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm sure everyone who's joined here has heard uh, plenty and probably more than they'd like about the potential of AI, and as a result, there's a lot of noise and it's hard to identify the signal in all that noise. So uh, one of the things I'd love to do is talk about the implications of AI for marketing. We've heard all sorts of input from different pundits, from Elon Musk to Sundar Pichai, about what their perspective is. Um, but in particular, going back to that one, Sundar Pichai has said that artificial intelligence will essentially have the same impact as water and fire on the progression of civilization. That's a pretty grand claim. That's really interesting to me, and I'm sure everyone else on the call, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into the marketing implications and how we as marketers can use artificial intelligence to further our practice. Uh, Tom, you speak a lot about what the future of technology uh, holds for us and what we'll be, we can look forward to as marketers. I want to start from the high level first and what the future will hold from data perspective, from artificial intelligence, and how it will impact the specialties we have. As, and then start to dive a little bit more into the specific applications of what you guys have done to help find and keep advantage for brands. Absolutely. So, you know, as as this whole discussion around, you know, AI is to fire and water to humanity, the way I look at it from a marketing perspective, one of the core elements that drive that's driving this golden age of AI is really around data. Data is essentially oil for artificial intelligence. And that becomes one of the key drivers for us. We've had so much acceleration around all of this massive velocity and volume of big data over the past few years. But from a marketing standpoint, in order for us to be able to action off of that data, we need intelligent systems, and specifically machine learning, which is human-coded algorithms, to help us parse through this unstructured information quickly so we can drive some type of action off of that. And that action can be anything from personalization to identifying new forms of context with individuals. So to me, it's less about it being fire and water and more about it being the fuel for the intelligent systems over the course of the next few years. And I, I, would, I would add to that, you know, if we think about um, that impact, the impact of industrialization on mass retail, mass produced products, one of the things that we've lost is that relationship that a vendor has with, with the consumer. Uh, you know, not long ago, my parents' generation and their parents' generation, the milkman would deliver milk to your home. They would probably know that someone in the house was lactose intolerant, make sure they got the right product actually had a relationship. You would go to the market. If you needed produce, you would go to uh, the market to buy produce, and you'd make a relationship. You'd have a relationship with different vendors. And I think, um, you know, along that way, as we've progressed as a civilization, we've also lost touch. Um, and so, the cool part about uh, looking at and using AI in the unstructured world is that, you know, I think IDC said uh, 10 trillion gigabytes of data were created last year. 10 trillion. And most of that was generated by consumers. So imagine using something like AI to interpret what it is that consumers mean when they're talking, when they're talking about retailers, talking to retailers, and trying to reestablish that, that type of relationship. 
So I, I do see this as an enabling technology um, that's that's an, as important uh, and, and maybe addressing a side effect of, of the technology re, you know, technical revolution. So. To that point, John, you mentioned that we've kind of become a little bit more isolated as time has gone, gone along. We had a little bit more community and relationship with the people that we bought from and interacted with uh, in it from a commerce perspective. It's almost highly ironic that you bring that up because people are blaming technology, especially social media, for a bit of the disconnect that we're experiencing these days. Uh, people feel more isolated than ever, despite the fact they have more communication with other people than ever. Essentially, what you're saying is artificial intelligence applied appropriately can start to help us understand each other a little bit better and have better communication or relationship with brands? That's right. Yeah, that's right. I yeah, and I agree with that as well. I think one of the things that we're seeing right now is that you know, over the past 10 or 15 years, consumer behavior has changed dramatically because of emerging technology. You know, we have expectations for on-demand content. We want real-time information. We want, you know, this accessibility leads to this empowerment of the consumer. What ends up happening is we're inputting into the technology. What AI is going to do if we take all of those specific experiences and behaviors and expectations and align that with intelligent systems, what we'll begin to see is this shift to where the technology is going to adapt to us and be a bit more predictive and responsive to our needs and, and handle tasks for us so that we can focus more on that kind of human interaction element. But that's also gonna have profound impacts to us as marketers because in some ways we're gonna be marketing to both individual consumers as well as to systems and algorithms at the same time. So that's a whole new kind of avenue. And as you look at the evolution of these experiences, shifting beyond desktop and mobile into voice, into vision, and into touch, that's gonna help drive these new interfaces and new ways of interacting with consumers over time. So it's again, as a marketer, it's a very exciting time because all of those elements, or all of those different interfaces and touch points are creating data. Machine learning and artificial intelligence help us to identify different themes, perceptions, and occasions. And so we're able to take an action off of that now. But we're also looking at where is this going in terms of this acceleration through intelligent systems and how that aligns with behavior and you know, going well beyond even the, the, the needs of today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that actually reminds me a lot of the e at 3 framework that you speak about a lot. Can you kind of give me a quick top line of what that is? Yeah, you can go to the next slide. So essentially, e at 3 is a filter for how we view the world. It's this idea of exponential acceleration. It's everything from consumer empowerment, which are those core behaviors that I touched on previously. What's the impact that emerging technology has on behavior? The second element of that is enhance. So that really ties into artificial intelligence and various systems that can be virtual assistants or other proxies and how that's going to evolve over time. And finally, the third is really around environment. Because what we're seeing is this kind of convergence of physical and digital. So over time, you have data being created across all of these various touch points, these different behaviors, these different interfaces, these different systems are all going to align together and converge. And when that happens, that's when we're gonna see technology adapting to us versus us adapting to technology. That's essentially what the, uh, the eCare 3 framework's all about. Very cool. Given the all the data that's being tossed off right now, I kinda wanna dive into specifically how we start to leverage that. And I'd love to have you guys bring me into how where you are using AI to identify new markets and new opportunities for brands. Sure, sure. I guess I'll start. Yeah. So, you know, met John about 24 months ago, and it's been a phenomenal partnership. John has a, an amazing technology that we've been leveraging and kind of co-creating new solutions for together over time. If you go to the next slide. One of, the, one of the core benefits of working with Epsilon is that we have some of the largest, most powerful proprietary transactional data sets in the world. And we have the data of identity. So that's structured data, and it's so structured and it's so robust that it actually goes outside of the bubble on the slide. So just, just that's, that's how enormous and powerful the assets are. Just remember that. One of the things we also need to do, though, from a marketing communication perspective, is how can we also take everything that's happening from an unstructured data standpoint? How can we look at everything from conversations to reviews to, to, to discussions that are happening, going back, dating back years? And how can we go so much further than traditional social listening, which is keyword based? You know, we want to be able to understand personality and psychographic elements of consumers. We want to be able to take and understand different themes and occasions and, and align that against our business strategy. So what we've actually done is we've combined the world of unstructured data 
with structure with Epsilon's powerful structure data assets to align new ways forward for our for our for our clients and our partners. And John's been a, an incredibly uh, great advocate for us and partner over this, that time. Now you're speaking my language. Hey man, <laughs> all good. Yeah, so we we've um, we built a number of algorithms that help us extract a lot of these elements like occasions and product attributes as perceived by consumers. And the net effect of that is that we're able to help uh, organizations uh, like Epsilon and their customers um, understand what it is that's meaningful in a category or industry uh, for a given brand or for their competitors. Um, so we've built a, a, a set of uh, tools or, or a platform to uncover landscape type uh, understandings, competitive analysis, uh, consumer behavioral analysis, and when you combine that with the structured side, the transaction. So I, I'm not just saying uh, that people use this product to go to the park and spend time with their family. I'm also saying, and they transact on that uh, during this season in, in, in particular. It, it provides a really nice way to combine an unaided observational data source with a behavioral data source that uh, is really, really quite compelling. So we've, we've been using it successfully for uh, building out audience or audience generation, for um, competitive segmentation, for just a number of different areas uh, with, with, uh, with you guys. And I think we should maybe go into some of those examples. Sure, yeah. Yeah. sounds good. Before we jump into the examples, I'd love for you to bring me through a bit of an example of how the machines understand this data, because we've, we've been using machine learning for a while now in different contexts. I mean, the field of artificial intelligence is 50 years old. Um, the old quote is, once it actually works, it's no longer called artificial intelligence. Um, but I'd love for you to tell me a little bit more about how machines actually understand what we're saying and then how we can actually build any insight off of that. Sure, sure. I, I think... Um... To do this, we should probably talk a little bit about how, how machines learn. And the key here is to understand first how humans learn. After all, we're modeling artificial intelligence after our own intelligence. And so if you think about, um, as a child, um, learning concepts like uh, the stove is hot. There are cues that you may have identified with as your hand moves closer to the stove. You start to feel heat. You may identify the redness of the metal with, uh, with that heat. And ultimately, if you happen to touch the touch the stove, then then you feel pain, right? And so, what you've essentially done is build a concept model that says, uh, when metal is glowing red, it it can it can cause pain. Um, as we move from concepts to linguistics or to to, to communication, um, your your hopefully your parental unit in most cases would say something like, hey, if you if you do this, it's going to feel like what happened when you touched that stove. So you start to be able to communicate that um, an experience you had in the past may also cause the same experience, even if it's uh, with some new uh, environmental condition. And then ultimately the role is, uh, for us, is to, as we're observing, and, and the human body has many different sensors, as we're observing our environment and the different conditions, we can start to better predict, based on history, what may happen in the future. And so when we think about machines and teaching machines, we have a number of tools, whether they're ontology-based or taxonomy-based, or in, in the case of, of, of our platform and our work together with Esplan, a bottoms-up view of a concept or a concept model. Um, we have the ability to decipher linguistics, so we understand the language as it applies to those concepts, um, so that when Tom says, hey, I went to breakfast with my family, and, and I say something like, I, I, I fed my dogs this morning, the idea that it's conceptually the same as a morning event in, in terms of nourishment, although the audiences are different. Um, it's, it's, it's the idea that um, we, can, we can say these things linguistically are the same. We're not word matching, we're concept matching at that point. And then because we have historical data, we can apply the patterns of those concepts over time so that we can predict what may happen in the future. So we've, we've really spent a lot of, of, of time building a process sort of mimic what the way humans learn and apply that to consumer conversations and consumer generated content um, for the benefit of, of, of marketing in this case. Yeah, and we can add other elements and models against that as well. So we partner together and leverage the ocean model, for example. So we can get into different personality types and align behavioral elements of, of individual profiles to then drive further communication and actioning there. So yeah. So it sounds like there's a lot of 
parallels between this and a focus group. When you're actually talking to people, you're communicating and understanding use case, events, the context around uh, a lot of what's happening with these products. I'm hearing a little bit about like the the importance of the machine itself. How is this different than, let's say, doing a bunch of focus groups? Um, the first is, I, I think focus groups are invaluable um, for in certain cases. Um, I, I do, however, think that there's something about observing uh, human behavior um, in in more of an unstructured space where, you know, I, I use the example often of um, if you ask a new mother, um, do you feed your kids um, the best possible food? Even if you're asking at a fast food restaurant, the answer will probably be yes, because there's an interpretation or a belief that if they answer incorrectly or give you the wrong answer, you're going to have a judgment. You're going to place a judgment on them. So. Um, oftentimes, I think focus groups. Th there's a there's a real value in when you're we're trying to identify something that maybe uh, the industry hasn't seen before, and you're asking opinion. But when you're when you're when you're trying to find out what's going on and what people are doing and how people use things, I think observational approaches have always had an advantage. It's just they've been expensive. It's ex extremely expensive to to watch, or you have people follow follow you around in the store. It might be even a little creepy. To see, you know, what is it that's getting your attention? Where are your eyes moving across the shelf? How are you walking? And we found ways to do that with beacons and other te techniques. Similarly, I think um, when you want to understand opinion or usage or consumption patterns or even personality, there are ways to do it in existing um, in, in existing industries and categories by simply listening. I, I like to say that consumers may already be telling you what you need to know, you just have to learn how to listen. That's yeah. And part of the way that, that we've been working together is we leverage machine learning and analysis of unstructured data as one component to form a hypothesis or to look at ways we can drive interesting correlations to then fuel some of our focus group behaviors. We kind of combine both. We do both the unstructured with focus groups, with custom panels, so that we can kind of bring the best of both worlds. One is correlation, one is potentially causation. So depending on what the objective is for the, for the end client, it may consist of, um, you know, we follow different forms of data roadmaps. So one form may be using machine learning on the upfront to understand what's happening within the category looking at and identifying specific behaviors. Um, what are some of those key affinities that we can identify? That then, uh, where's there potentially white space from a, a communication strategy perspective? Then we would take it a step further and apply that against either mobile ethnography or we're following people, you know, like you mentioned previously, uh, different panels or even our own kind of uh, shopper's voice platform, which is one of the largest panel platforms out there as well. So we combine each of those elements to drive a specific business response and a strategy. And unstructured data and machine learning play a very key role in that as we kind of follow a prescriptive approach to how we actually action off the data. That's awesome, guys. Uh, I'd love to dive into some examples. Can you show us a little bit more about the, the actual uh, products of what you're talking about? Yeah, of course. That's why we're here. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, maybe before that, uh, we've got a slide up here. I just want to talk a little bit about what it is that we do to understand and before we actually deliver insights. And I think it's key because a lot of times, um, especially when when uh, the industry is thinking about big data, um, you know, there was a, a, a myth that I think has been debunked years ago that you can just throw an enormous amount of data at a set of algorithms and they will magically tell you uh, something amazing, something insightful. And I, and I think, you know, there, there definitely is a role in, in big data and large amounts of data and, and uh, understanding which algorithms, sets of algorithms you need to decipher what it is that you're looking for. And I think the first piece, and, and this goes back to, I think, when we started our careers, is garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. So the first step is really in finding out where the conversations are, are happening that have the best likely chance of answering the questions that you may have in your mind. Or if you don't have a, a predetermined question, where are those conversations occurring that uh, people are talking about your category or your industry. And so we, we start our, our process by seeding uh, our environment and, and having it understand a, a given category. So we, we build some shallow classification to understand what it is that's important, and from there we can outlink and collect further conversations. 
And we run it through a process similar to the one I described earlier around communication and conceptual mapping and machine learning to basically identify what are those themes, what are those uh, consumer occasions, what are the uh, perceived value attributes for a product or brand, and, and, and what are the perceptions? How well is that product attribute filling the, filling the occasion, the need state? Um, and we're able to show that over, over time. So um, I think it's important to understand, you know, when, when someone's talking about uh, AI and how they use AI, I think, you know, there's a curriculum to this stuff. You're, you're teaching machines something, they need to know a little bit about what they're, they're going to be learning. And so this is our process that we've been using now with, you know, at, at, at Oculus as well as with Epsilon now for quite a number of years. Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, we've done a lot of great work with, with Epsilon. I mean, I have some favorites, and, and uh, I can still remember sitting around the room being asked, okay, uh, we've got this. We've got this idea that esports is going to go crazy. This is even before I think it's exploded. I mean, it's still it's at the verge. But you know, even you know, Tom's got a good 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 mind to see around corners. And I was like, this thing is going to be hot. I want to understand how will it affect brands? How will it affect our ability to to market? He said, so can you can we find a way to predict um, which brands might uh, have the best, most authentic uh, means to inject themselves in this category of esports, and and yeah. even so, are there are there different games that different brands would be as associated with? I, I was thinking like, whoa, that's a good question. Yeah, so. it's it's such a it's such a rapidly growing. Um, gosh, it's amazing. So there are over 300 million people globally right now that tune into esports, and esports is essentially competitive gaming. And so I have three Gen Zs in my household. I've got a 15, a, a 13, and a 10. Gen Z is 1996 to 2010. You know, the first mobile native generation. They learned to swipe before they learned to speak. And one of the core behaviors here that you see is that you've got two and a half hours a day spent on on-demand content, uh, specifically around YouTube and streamers, so as well as Netflix and some of the other platforms. And an hour and a half a day is spent gaming. So if you take and combine that, and you look at the amount of time and energy being spent in terms of not only playing, but also watching competitive esports, it's something that uh, my 15-year-old son, you know, he's actually an aspiring esports athlete, and he always jokes around, you know, when we start talking about career paths and everything else, he's always like, "But esports is athletics of the mind," and so even the way he thinks about it, he, how he approaches it, he approaches it almost like a job in terms of continuing to, to practice on a daily basis, creation of content, publishing of content. It's incredibly interesting because by 2020, Gen Z is going to represent 40% of consumers in the marketplace. And they start bringing these expectations of on-demand content, real-time expectations. You know, when they actually even communicate and talk with each other, it's face-to-face -face via FaceTime. They don't actually call each other. So there are little nuances of what they expect out of experiences that kind of transcend through. And even in how they consume entertainment, and specifically with esports, and this whole democratization of competition across PC and console. So one of the things we wanted to do is partner together and figure out, all right, how can we take all of this vast information tied to you know, esports and gamers and begin to segment them in a way that makes it actionable on behalf of brands? So we partnered together in turn with Oculus and began to look at to go to So we began to look at how can we create custom segments as a starting point? You know, aligning specific affinities and behaviors with game types. With the ultimate goal then is how can we create a scoring index that we can know and identify and deliver a known audience of a specific gaming type that we could then drive an action on behalf of a brand. Because brands are looking at different options. Do I do I drive sponsorship? Do I potentially host events? Do I purchase and own a team? So there are a lot of questions tied to the sport, to the industry, how, what role brands play beyond traditional sponsorship and advertising. So what we wanted to do is be a little ahead of the curve and really closely identify certain key personality traits across generational cohorts. So here on the screen, you can see we used, again, the ocean model which is essentially this uh, psychographic behavioral model to where we can look at and identify certain key attributes of a personality and align it with a certain game type. And if you go to the next slide. And then what we were able to do is partner together to actually create this index to where we could look at certain brands 
and where they can align with certain audiences so that we could deliver value against sponsorships or audience. So it's using data in a new and compelling way against an emerging market so that we can understand and identify key behaviors from unstructured data that could lead to new opportunities and unlocking of new market opportunities. This was done in partnership with Oculus 360, with Epsilon Agency, and uh, with uh, Triple Clicks, which is another strategic partner here as well, led by Chris Erb. So between the three of us, we really took Triple Clicks expertise in the gaming space, aligned with our data expertise, aligned with Oculus 360, and you know their machine learning intelligence, combined them together to create a new offering to open up uh, new market opportunities. Very cool. And as a former competitive gamer myself, I love this study. Um, <laughs> The, on the slide you're on right now, you talk about fans of first-person shooters, and you've got both the, the character traits as well as some potential brands that could be sponsors of these events. If I'm a, a brand that's looking to investigate this space, I see a lot of beverage brands, but who else outside of that territory seem to have some sort of relevance within the space of competitive gaming and this emerging field? That's a great question, Ian. The thing that, that most brand marketers need to understand is it's not just about beverage. It's not, that's not the only way in. The key here, it's around lifestyle. The, the core thing here is if you as a brand can enable a, a, a unique experience within the gaming realm, that's really the fastest way and connection point in. It's more about the lifestyle connections versus positioning and pushing product or product-centric content or basically showing you know, just some just random association of you with a gamer in the image. It goes so much deeper than that because each subset and each segment has a different way in which they identify themselves virtually and their associations with certain brands that fit that better than others. So what we really wanted to do was find pathways in for not only beverage-based brands, but you think of beverage, you think of automotive, you think of telecom, you think of you know um, spirits. There are a number of different ways in to the space. And so we wanted to make sure that we could account for the ideal audience type versus the category type. Speaking about the audience type, it looking at from the outside into the competitive gaming space, since it's so nascent, it is, would there be a common assumption that the gamers are just gamers and you should talk to them in the same way? Or did you find some really strong differences in personality and receptiveness in different groups of gamers? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I think uh, that's a great question, and, and, and you know the key here is is one: how do you identify the audience that we're studying across these games? And so, um, for that, um, we used online engagement. And so, you can think of online engagement, um, especially in social space. There's different ways that you can participate. Um, one is you can like, or you can retweet, or you can thumbs up things. The other is you can create or craft original content that's either sent to or about a given game or gamer, um, or in this case, even a sporting event. Um, and so, so what we were able to do is actually um, uncover, based on these various audience types, um, a set of features that um, were distinct and relevant for not just types of games, but even types of teams within these sports and, and, and the leagues. And so we built um, something that uh, we've taken to market with Epsilon called our audience affinity and our ability to basically understand an audience for a given um, subject matter um, area and apply a predictive score to see how authentically that audience uh, might be um, engaged with with a different brand. So, it's uh, to Tom's point. I mean, there's a number of features we're using. Um, one of Forrester's uh, predictions for 2018 is that uh, this is the year of context for AI and the year of inferred attribution. And so, if you can imagine, based on speech, the, not just the ability to understand what someone's personality traits may be or, or what uh, generation they may come from, but also what are their interests and what are their hobbies, what are their other attitudes, um, are there val do they have a value system? And you can do that by following these, these people that we, we, we found engaged, building a set of features that then could be compared to brands. And I think one of the nice parts about um, the Oculus platform is we had over 80 different categories that we could compare them to. So to your point earlier, and yeah, it wasn't just beverages. There were a number of other categories where there were pretty high hits. Um, but uh, yeah, it was 
a lot of fun. I, you know, I really enjoyed this this work. You, when you while you're just describing that, you said something about inferred attribution, and I think that's a really important thing to dive into. Um, with machine learning, it, there's a perception that machine learning really helps you kind of sift through all sorts of data, but it doesn't actually make the conclusions for you. Um, but there's also the other side of people thinking that uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, is going to take all of our jobs. I'm sure there's a middle ground there. Can you tell me a little bit more about what inferred attribution can do for a marketer and what we can expect um, for the different specialties, whether it's um, brand planners, strategists, et cetera? Sure, sure. So if you think of inference in general, a human inference, if I can take you, maybe you close your eyes and, and, I, and I paint a picture of you know, a, a man and a woman um, in their 20s walking along a beach side by side the human mind looks at that and, and may um, judge or infer that um, these people have a relationship. Um, then you, the same picture, and now they're holding hands, and the relationship is maybe stronger. You're, you're now, in, you're, you're able to inference that. And maybe you see other cues like both um, parties have a ring on their, on their wedding finger or their ring finger, and you're th then that relationship again has changed. And, they didn't. You didn't ask. You didn't. You didn't. Um, there was nothing that really tells you these people are married. And, and, and in fact, um, probabilistically, well, probabilistically, they are married. It could be that they're 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 not married. But you know, in a, in the, the the goal here is that machines have basically taken cues, social cues, cultural cues, and other things to understand and say that this um, couple is probably most likely married. And so. I can extract that to a number of things. When uh, we talked a little bit of, about the concept mapping of breakfast, um, when someone says something like, hey, um, I'm going to grab um, something to eat this morning, the computer is inferring that this person is having a breakfast occasion. Um, similarly, if someone is talking about um, enjoying their time at the Louvre, the computer is able to infer that, or our, our AI is able to come infer that this person is artistically interested, or at least um, you know, tour, you know, touring. And so, um, the ability to actually collect and build um, a precise, or at least a, a, a highly um, uh, available scoring system that says uh, the computer has identified these sets of patterns or cues and says that this. Uh, thing is most likely something else is is kind of how we we build this these inference models and those get used um, in a number of different ways and from an agency application perspective one of the things we look at is I'm a big believer in yes it's artificial intelligence but I'm also a big believer in intelligence augmentation I'm not a big believer that there's going to be this super hive mind AI that's going to develop for this general intelligence. You know, think Skynet, think the Matrix. You know, we're not going to become batteries. That's that's <laughs> not going to happen, at least not yet. Um, but what I look at is how can we take and leverage the tools to further drive our own intelligence, our own analysis, our own ability to drive kind of understanding strategic intent, so that we can drive business results and growth. Because at the end of the day, marketing is now a growth business. So if we're able to take and quickly process an action off of large amounts of data, quickly understand themes, quickly understand perceptions, understand behaviors, understand occasions, and all of these elements together, we can redefine how we approach and look at the consumer decision journey. So again, it takes us, we've gone through this evolution of content marketing to contextual marketing, you know, to real-time marketing, and what's coming next is kind of this, this predictive marketing towards more about situational awareness, understanding the environment and the context around you, and how the systems are working together in addition to everything previous to that. So artificial intelligence is going to essentially augment our ability to process that information, to understand how to work across voice, vision, touch, as those experiences I mentioned at the very onset continue to kind of converge together. So that's that's the view of um, inference attribution. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, you guys uh, you give a great example of looking at a, an emerging industry and insights that can be brought out of that. I was curious to see if there's anything from a machine learning perspective that you've kind of focused the lens on an industry or a market where it seems like the ideas might have been saturated 
or it, there's a, a common trope that plays out again and again to bring new life to something. I'm sure there's a lot of interest in using that volume of data to hopefully find some gems that can be refined from a universal truth perspective, from an insight perspective. Is there anything that you've done from that lens? Absolutely. So we've got a great, a great industry case study. I can't reveal the actual client. But what we did is they were a market leader in their category for a very long time. And due to certain reasons, they backed off of certain core ingredients within their product that over time they began to lose their position in terms of brand preference. We were actually in partnership with Oculus, able to look back over the course of 10 years, analyze the entire domain in that specific category, identify movers within the industry and how they gain market share as this organization backed off of that positioning. We were able to identify creative white space to where by focusing on these core elements of the messaging across these specific demographics and these cohorts, we could then begin to recapture preference and recapture market share. So we wouldn't have been able to see that if we weren't able to take and analyze all of the unstructured data tied to that, identify kind of the shifts and changes of perception associated with the brand over that period of time. And now the brand is back towards you know, quickly regaining market share based on this understanding, but also using behavioral um, behavioral targeting associated with the marketing messaging to further drive that connection with the individual uh, consumers. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else to that topic. Yeah, no, that was that was great. I, I actually forgot about that case. Study. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> um, I, I was thinking of another one as you were as you were talking, Ian, um, and this is just at a category level, you know. Um, we worked with Epsilon to study the minivan category, mm -hmm. which I found really interesting because it's a category that, you know, growing up, um, you know, for me, they weren't a van and they weren't a car. There was something in between. You didn't really know what to make of them. We never had one growing up. But, I, you know, I, you know, you, you look at the way that it's marketed today. It's it's really about convenience. You know, do the do the secondary and tertiary doors, do they open with hands free? Do you have the right cup holders? Um, can you actually pacify your passengers, whether they're adults or kids, in the back seat? Um, and and so you know when when asked you know can we find something to hand to creative that is compelling and interesting and maybe new? Um, you know we we studied the the minivan category and found um, something that I, I was like intrigued with. It said uh, you know when looking at millennials. There was a pattern in conversation about using minivans for going out, and you know, I thought about that. Wow, that's that's in our leisure category. So it's a leisure vehicle for millennials. We got to find more here, you know. And so looking at that a little closer, you see it's it's going out and and it's even night out. And so you know, we we sort of stopped there on the Oculus side and said, hey, look, we found this. We're really intrigued with it. I think it could be something creative could probably use to build some kind of position. Um, and we handed it back to Epsilon, who you guys then did a mobile eth ethnographic study where you surveyed out on the handheld uh, millennials that had recently purchased or owned a minivan, and you got back some great, yeah. great insights around, you know, using it uh, for six adults to go out where, with one designated driver, and and using it for tailgates at games and and drive-ins, and, and I mean, I think it was really interesting, you know, as I take a step back to work that I don't think either of us were a part of in the, the, the swagger wagon sort of popularity where this is a this is a tool that's great for families but you don't have to be you know uncool and you can use it for fun things and I, I, I thought that was a, that was another interesting case yeah yeah that's really cool I love that example um, I'm curious if there's any other industries that you see some great application for this that uh, might be outside the ones that we've talked to if I'm a brand marketer, what kind of questions should I be asking myself about the value of machine learning and how I should be approaching machine learning for my own brand? So this is one of the questions I'm asked all the time, whether I'm in a meeting with CMOs or their teams. It's, what else can I be doing? So to me, it's not only about unstructured data, that's a piece of it, but it's having a comprehensive data strategy and an approach that aligns with how you're, you're driving communication forward. I'll give you an example. A lot of clients have first-party data assets, so they've done some type of CRM profiling over time. They've developed this, this robust library of email addresses. You can then also take a relationship with Epsilon 
which has some of the most you know powerful data assets on the planet. You look at Total Source Plus, 200 million consumers, 2,000 data points across individuals, Shoppers View, which I've mentioned before, 75 million, and on and on and on. So you've got this whole data of identity combined with first-party data of people that, that you've connected with, and then you pull in the unstructured component, and you can do so much more than just media targeting. When I talk to clients, the way they view data is as a viewpoint vehicle into media activation and targeting. But I don't see a lot of organizations or brand marketers actually using this combination of unstructured, first party, and structured data to actually drive business decisioning when it comes to communication strategy beyond media. And that's a, that's a key area that over time, especially as the consumer decision journey evolves into both consumer and system-based journeys, we're going to have to account for a comprehensive consolidated data strategy to where you're aligning data of culture with data of identity plus the first party data to drive the business forward. Understanding those points of intersection for real-time communication, understanding the role of intelligent systems and virtual assistants when brands may be disintermediated as you know moving forward, what is the role then that uh, that predictive elements can play in terms of that experience moving forward? So it's not just about the data strategy of today. It's not just about machine learning. It's not just about that individual uh, first party data. It's the combination of all of them moving forward that drive to specific growth targets. So speaking to what you just said, it sounds like for a brand uh, marketer, there's a lot of moving parts here. Yes. And a lot of people look at the perspective of, uh, of data as being data driven. We all, all heard everybody's data driven. How many inputs are usually involved in something like that when you're talking about looking at insights at the, uh, the, uh, the front end of the process versus just for media targeting? But I'm trying to develop these insights for a I mean, you're looking at millions of attributes, and it's really the combination of the attributes. One way in which we approach that is we look at how can we take those thousands of attributes and create a dimension around individuals. Mm -hmm. Taking it from thousands to maybe 20 or 30 different attributes that can begin to tell a story tied to that specific dimension. A dimension can be anything of who you are, what you buy, etc. So if you can take and have an understanding and then, then apply that with what John was mentioning around conceptual models, I think the real thing that we're uncovering here is that, you know, taking that understanding of structured data and adding additional and overlaying different concepts from, you know, uh, from just a, a non-personal direct action. It's not a panel that's actually giving you this feedback. It's real behavior that's happening. By combining the two of those, that's where you begin to unlock. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's yeah, a great answer. And I and, and I do see there are specific applications where we're seeing real business impact and growth, um, whether that's in identifying an, an, an audience for conquesting that is maybe not necessarily just building an email list, but actually understanding what consumers look like that are engaged with your competitors and then working backwards to understand are those people also transacting using some of the data sets that, uh, that Tom was talking about. So there's, yeah, we found a number of different cases, whether it's understanding do, 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 is the content that I'm offering on my own properties similar to what I'm seeing others offering or what's going the conversations online and and then aligning a content strategy around that so we, there's just been a number of different applications that uh, have uh, been using this this data plus web behavior plus sales transactions to uh, to, to uh, grow business yeah Content strategy is also an interesting area you were just talking about. It. Can you dive a little bit deeper into how something like this can inform a brand's content strategy? Certainly, yeah. So the, the content strategy, and we, we recently did a great great bit of work with Epsilon, um, where you know we, as we're studying one of these new categories and teaching um, machines what's important and not and how to identify those things, um, you know, we, we build a corpus of data that's basically a digital signal for what's going on off, you know, anywhere. So it could be in social, it could be in discussion forums, it could be on e-commerce reviews. And and these ideas then get communicated and aggregated and rolled up to brands and other channels, digital channels and other things. So now, imagine for a second that I also study what it is that a brand has to say, either on their own property, their own website, or through uh, their own marketplace um, sort of uh, projections or PLA or product listings and, that, and whatnot. What I'm able to have the machine do is compare the two. 
and say, is, it, is what this merchant, retailer, or brand talking about, is it similar enough to what consumers are saying and talking about? Is the volume the same? Is the proportions of that conversation similar? And what it enabled us to do is identify content gaps, um, identify topics that would fill those gaps, so machine-identified um, content ideas. Um, it also, we were able to do a, a lot of other really cool um, sort of identification and insight that drove into the agency's content strategy and, and, and ultimately to you know, new creative, new, new blog uh, content. And um, the idea being that if you're providing what people want, then you should see bumps in SEO and engagement and also use the machines to help you organize it. So it was a pretty interesting bit of work and, and one of our newer offerings that we're getting a lot of traction around. Awesome. Uh, we're coming close to the end of the hour, so I wanted to be sure if there's anything that you guys wanted to talk about that I missed, uh, we could use that opportunity to explore those topics. Yeah, at this point in time, I um, just wanted to thank everybody for tuning in today, and you know, we're obviously here to help support, and we can help basically define data strategies, aligning that with research, aligning that with traditional planning, as well as what we call data design. So it's taking all of these elements together uh, mapping that into you know, things that actually drive growth to the business. One of the things we actually did is we reviewed every single creative brief we've had over the last four years and identified four primary territories, acquisition, retention, growth, win back, as kind of core constructs. And what we're looking at doing is how can we further align our data assets to drive business growth moving forward? How can we take those thousands of attributes and continue to align them against these core dimensions that ultimately help inform business growth. So as you look at where we're going from an Epsilon agency perspective, you know, obviously in partnership with John and Oculus, it's really that. It's not just about brand communication. It's about this idea of being a growth engine and a driver for our clients. You know, we understand how experiences are going to evolve beyond desktop and mobile into voice, vision, and touch, and all these other elements moving forward. We understand the role that artificial intelligence and intelligent systems are going to play in the creation of new data sets and how we analyze existing data and how we basically can basically take and integrate emerging data sets. So we understand that. And that's a really unique position in the marketplace specific to other industries. We're not just creative, we're data-driven creative. We're not just strategy, we're data-infused strategy. And we're not just you know innovation we're at, that's tracking trends. We're applying trends, working with strategic partners, driving rapid prototyping and development there, but always, always, always with a lens on the application of data and ultimately driving growth for our clients. That's great. Awesome. Ian, I, if I could just add, um, uh, I would say that um, one other point is um, is that you know as, as we're starting to see shifts in, in the role of the agency and even consulting firms um, where brands are starting to uh, not just maintain the marketing um, conversation and relationship with customers, but also start to take products direct, whether that's through uh, marketplaces like Amazon or others, it's been really intriguing and interesting to help them understand while they're getting started um, in this D2C strategy or in their D2C strategy, um, what is that that uh, customers, why it is that they're buying. They already know that they're being bought. They may know where they're being bought, but um, to help um, identify what are the occasions that they're being used and does that differ across the country or for different cohorts and um, how can I be uh, a better, more, pr providing more authentic um, engagement in various marketplaces? Like, is there a difference between um, providing goods in Amazon versus providing them on another third-party channel? Um, I think uh, the role of this data, um, again, and, and an agency uh, and, and firm like uh, Epsilon is, is, is tremendously valuable. And so I'm excited to see, you know, as this industry continues to change and, and uh, migrate towards this uh, value creation, um, it's, uh, it's going to be incredibly compelling to watch uh, how data continues to get used in different various ways. And Ian, did you have any final uh, thoughts or statement there for the audience? Um, I just want to say thank you guys for joining all of us. This has been a, a really great um, webinar and opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into artificial intelligence and machine learning. I know I've benefited tremendously from working with you guys. It's been a very eye-opening to see the potential power of it and see it applied. So it's definitely made my job a lot more exciting, and uh, I'm looking forward to doing a lot more of it.
So thank you to the audience for joining us today. Um, we had a, a large group join us. It's been great to have you with us. And if, for those of you who weren't able to join, or those of your uh, colleagues who weren't able to join, this is being recorded, so you should be getting a copy of this. And please feel free to distribute the link uh, to those who you think this would be valuable to. And hopefully we'll see you again on another webinar in the near future. Thanks again for joining.